So, uh, this morning uh, is Saturday. Uh, it is uh, December 6th, uh, and uh, we are having our uh, half day, uh, December 6, 2014. We're having our half day uh, uh, Zazenkai in honor of a kind of mini, mini uh, Rohatsu, in honor of the Buddha's great, uh, most profound enlightenment experience, in which, to one tiny degree or another, we too can partake of this and embody uh, this uh, practice uh, of realization in our own lives. Uh, so this morning's Teisho will be on the, uh, the Buddha's enlightenment, um, the story of it, and a commentary on it. I originally wrote this piece back in 19, of the Buddha's enlightenment, not the commentary, Back in probably 1972 or three, it's it's the original piece I wrote has been used every year since uh, by the Rochester Zen Center, uh, its affiliates, and other uh, Zen uh, centers uh, as part of Rohatsu ceremonies around the world. Uh, somehow, uh, is a, a karma that arose very early in my practice to have a feeling for the Buddha's enlightenment and to uh, uh, create a piece that uh, reflected that. Uh, that piece uh, appeared in my book, The Hungry Tigress, uh, in a little more complete form than the red version. And this is a, yet another form that I basically uh, edited and created to work as a Teisho that could be commented on. Uh, so, it goes like this. When the prince of the Shakya clan, Siddhartha Gautama, was 29, he saw, as if for the first time, an old man, a sick man, a dead man, and at last of all, a solitary and homeless truth seeker. He took it in, aging, sickness, death, and realized that no one, no matter how privileged, escapes, and he became determined to seek greater wisdom. He took off his jewels, left the protective walls of his palace, shaved his beard, cut his long hair, and crossing the river boundary of his father's kingdom, entered the lonely forests and mountains and never looked back. He sought out the two most widely respected religious teachers of his time and mastering their methods gained steadiness and calm. Yet he knew he was still not yet free from birth, old age, sickness, and death. So he moved on to yet more isolated places, deep forests and graveyards, where he took up the path of severe austerities, attempting to gain liberation by willfully harming the body. In time, he began limiting his eating of food until he was surviving on a thousand, then a hundred, then ten, then at last just one sesame seed a day. His flesh and muscles withered away. His eyes sank deep into their sockets. His hair rotted and fell out. His ribs, bony sockets, joints, skull, and major bones stood out like the wreck of a ship that is revealed by the withdrawing tide. After six years of effort, he was exhausted, hovering at the point of death, more a skeleton wound with sinews and veins than a living man. And now, having failed in his quest, he would die. His great effort totally wasted, his life purpose unfulfilled. The bitterness of that moment could have no relief. And if you look up on the altar before you leave today, you'll see... I put out there uh, Buddha, we might say, images uh, that show various milestone moments uh, in the life of the Buddha. One of them is of the moment of his near death uh, from austerities. Uh, we all make mistakes in our practice. We all try, not even in our practice, in our lives, trying to get who knows what, some of which are very harmful. Uh, the Buddha, too, uh, went down those roads. And that image is important important one. It's a, the one that's on the altar is actually a copy of a very, very famous sculpture in India. Take a look at it at some point. Then, just there at the dead end limit of the ascetic path, he came to the end of that road. In this moment of deepest despair, there flashed into his mind the memory of a certain festival day from deep in his childhood. 
He'd been seated under a rose apple tree then, watching his father, the nobles, and his peasants, <clears throat> peasants too, plowing the earth together. He saw the earth breaking open in even wave-like furrows, the heat shimmering up off the freshly opened soil and shining on the sweat-slick brows and straining bodies of men and oxen alike. Uh, the sun flashing off the gilded traces and horns of the royal oxen. He heard the plodding rhythm of hooves and cowbells rolling in a solemn sea-like way beneath the shrill shouts of the men and the whirring cries of the birds as they dove to peck at and devour the billowing hordes of insects, blind glistening grubs, cut worms, and broken bodies of mice which men, oxen, and plows left in their wake. Child though he was, the terribly obvious laboring, devouring, suffering, and dying, which went on beneath the surface tinseling of all his own easy, festival-like days had broken in upon him then, and weighed heavily on his mind. Seated uh, alone beneath the rose-apple tree, reflecting deeply on the scene before him, self-centeredness had fallen away as he entered a profound samadhi. Now, at the brink of death, this memory returned, filling him with renewed energy and purpose. If he'd glimpsed the way when just a child, well-fed and clothed, then attaining enlightenment, he now saw, could not depend on punishing the body. As if in response, Sujata, a maiden from a neighboring village, now came and offered him, this dying holy man, a bowl of milk rice. He accepted her life-saving meal, and his five ascetic disciples, horrified, convinced that the ex-prince had abandoned his quest for truth immediately got up and left him. He ate in silence, alone. When he had finished, uh, when he had finished somehow, he felt strong enough to stand. Leaning on his staff, he rose and slowly made his way to the near, uh, nearby Naranjana River where he had last bathed, washing away six years of accumulated filth and dirt. Climbing back up onto the shore, he announced, This is indeed the day of my supreme enlightenment. May this bowl float upstream. He cast his empty bowl onto the water, where it forged upstream against the current to the whirlpool of Kala Nagaraja, the Black Snake King. There it whirled down, down into the jeweled chambers of the Naga King's palace and came to rest against an endless row of identical bowls. Clink! Hearing that sound, the Naga king raised his ancient hooded head. Yesterday a Buddha arose, he proclaimed. Today there shall be another Buddha, Swaha, awake, rejoice. And he began to chant his ancient songs in praise of, the Bodhisattva, of a Bodhisattva's final triumph and victory. And the Bodhisattva, Siddhartha Gautama, moving like a roused lion, now strode towards the Bodhi tree. There, in the cool, soft light of the late afternoon, he met a poor grass cutter who offered him eight bundles of grass to serve as a sitting cushion and mat. Then the future Buddha, spreading the grass at the base of the tree, seated himself in the full lotus posture. With his resolve now deeply rooted as a mountain, he announced, though only my skin, sinews, and bones remain, and my blood and flesh dry up and wither away, I will not leave this spot until I have attained full enlightenment. And he pressed silently forward again in deepening Zazen. Then fearsome and foul as well as seductive and pleasant visions arose around him. All the forces of life's clinging to states of joy, comfort, and ease came swaying to him in the form of three women, the three beautiful daughters of Mara, the tempter. They danced before him, offering exquisite pleasure, unceasing comfort, endless rest, while life's terrors, fears of death and suffering, of hell's horrors, pain, ugliness, the unknown, mobbed him, shrieking of torment, deformity, and all manner of terrible and disgusting experience should he persist. Mara's army descended, horse-headed, ten-eyed, tiger-faced, many-armed, with faces in their chests, with sharp yellow teeth and blood-dripping mouths, with spiders for hands, hissing with adders' tongues. On they came, heaving stones, knives, spears, 
hurling flaming discs, mud, and filth. Shrieking madly, they whirled upon him like a flock of hunger-maddened crows striving to peck or tear some slight scraps of nourishment from a huge smooth stone, and they could not. At last, Mara the tempter himself approached the future Buddha, assuming the voice of Gotama's own innerness, the habit voice of his own thoughts, began to question the future Buddha. Are you sure you're the one? Sure you have this Buddha nature? Sure you are worthy of coming to supreme enlightenment today, right now? Think of it. Supreme enlightenment. Supreme enlightenment. But the future Buddha only touched the earth with his right hand and asked the earth to witness for him. And the earth replied with a hundred, a thousand, a hundred, thousand, thousand voices, the voices of furrows and graves, voices of youth and age, of man, woman, and child, the unheeded cries of beasts, the quick unknown silvery language of fish, the sweet twinings of plants and the warm, gray crumblings of stone, for all were one voice thundering. He is worthy. There is not one spot on this globe where he has not already offered himself totally, selflessly, through endless lifetimes to the attainment of enlightenment and the welfare of all living beings. Mara vanished. His army dropped their weapons and fled. His daughters prostrated, asking forgiveness left. Mara's war elephant mountain-girded the lumbering vehicle of ego's prideful, self-centered strength came crashing to the ground like a heap of stones before the slight form of this man seated so quietly and intensely before him, and then it too was gone. Alone beneath the bow tree, the future Buddha pressed on without stopping, arousing deeper and deeper practice without cease, transcending limitations swallowing the darkness with his own light until with the dawn his mind was clear and radiant and obvious as the daybreak. And when he glanced at the morning star, he found enlightenment itself crying out, wonder of wonders. Intrinsically, all living beings are Buddhas, endowed with wisdom and virtue. He was 35 years old and had broken through to what others only half dreamed the path had been reopened. The Dharma was again accessible to the efforts of humans and devas. In the steadily rising morning light, a fully realized Buddha now sat beneath the suddenly blossoming tree. So, now let's take a look at this from a perspective, perspective of practice. Please take a comfortable position. So, enlightenment or intimacy is both the goal and the living, beating heart of Zen. Gaining some calm and experiencing peaceful sitting is good. Just look at the madness of our world, if you doubt that. But if calm were all that Siddhartha sought, he would never have needed to leave home. He could have stopped off at any local forest retreat. Get your calm on here. The billboards were up all over the place. It wasn't enough. Having personally experienced impermanence, the insubstantiality of every person and thing, a fire was lit in his mind, heart, and gut. After that, he simply had no choice. He had to keep going until he could touch real and solid ground. It's not just Zen Buddhist, but a universal impulse, this desire to go beyond habitual limits and find a wider, truer vista. James Stevens in Irish Fairy Tales writes, the man who keeps putting one foot in front of the other will leave his homeland behind and come at last to the sea and the end of the world. Similar words were written by Haku and Zenji in Japan a hundred or so years earlier. The Buddha, not just in this last life, but through countless previous ones, take that literally or metaphorically, also kept going as the Jataka show. Onward, they proclaim, one step, one life after another. It's a teaching we can all take to heart wherever we are, Whatever we may have realized or not realized, we too can commit to making the effort to keep going. The essence, as has been said of genius, is 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. We do the work. Then we keep doing the work. One aha moment will not suffice. 
Many have fallen there thinking, oh, I've got it, I'm done, now I'll just live my life. The Zen tradition says how many skulls litter the ground. Kensho, touching the ground of mind is not the end of the road. Touching the ground, no matter in how slight a way we do it or how profound, is simply a beginning. Like walking through a door, opening our eyes and saying, oh, here's the ground. Then we can continue on in our journey, knowing intimately now for ourselves that real ground lies beneath our feet. In a number of jatakas, in a variety of past lives, the bodhisattva clearly sees into the reality of selflessness, the identity of form and emptiness, relative and absolute. That is, he realizes true nature. These are milestone moments, to be sure, but not the full realization of his goal. To contextualize, we could say that in past lives, before his birth as the prince Siddhartha Gotama, he had already seen clearly enough to have been a religious teacher, a senior Zen student, a committed lay as well as fully ordained practitioner, a Vajrayana student, a hermit monk, a community leader, a wandering sadhu, a Theravadan monastic, not to mention businessman, family man, carpenter, juggler, robber, ox herder, farmer, caravan leader, etc., as well as having countless lives committing himself to basic ethical practices, whether as human, god, or animal. Buddhist tradition says regardless of where he was born, whatever form he was born into, or whatever challenging life issue he faced, he always chose to go further, over the next hill, beyond the next river, through the next dark forest. Not ignoring a problem, but working with it, he actualized the way onward. Further was his nature as it is our own. It is why the Tao is called the way or the path. Practice realization is not static. It is a road that continues endlessly. A Japanese saying sums it up. Even the great Shakyamuni himself is still only halfway there. This is a stunning pointer as to how endless, so-called endlessness might be. Zen reveres the story of the Buddha's, historical Buddha's enlightenment, because it so dramatically shows our own highest potential, as it shows the work, the persistence, perseverance, and dedication that underlies all milestone experiences. There are pointers to practice throughout the classical narrative. The Buddha has his Christ on the cross moment when he discovers that his willful asceticism has not clarified a thing, but only leaves him bereft in a dark and empty place. And though the ex-prince sat and sat in the end, it still wasn't enough. There was a trigger to his deep experience. Realization didn't simply come from looking within. It could have been a word, a sound, or anything, but what happened is that he glanced up after a long dark night of focused practice and saw the morning star. Aha! Then a morning star sat on eight bundles of grass. Gone. Gone. Entirely gone, as the Prajna Paramita Vidaya Heart of Perfect Wisdom says. No one seeing is real seeing. No one sitting is real sitting. Just star. Only star. And then the Buddha-to-be didn't just sit quietly unmoving beneath the Bodhi tree. He responded. When Mara challenged him, he didn't get caught up in it, but he didn't ignore it either. When situation arise in our lives, we can't just go off and sit until they're gone. There is a time to act. It need not be a big deal. In fact, it would be wise to not make it, whatever it is, into a big deal. Challenged, the Buddha simply touched the earth and asked the earth to witness for him. With that one simple act and one simple request, Mara's world was crushed. The Buddha-to-be didn't get into an argument. He didn't try to out-argue Mara to make his winning case. Instead, he made a simple gesture and a simple request, and it was enough. And there's an honest truth, too, in the story's point that the final obstacle the Buddha had to face was himself, that is, his own rarefied self-doubt. In a sense, self-doubt is what all obstacles come down to. 
and much of what passes for self-confidence may only be a hedge. What is beyond both self-doubt or self-confidence, or either? Many people, when passed on an initial koan, have an experience of falling into doubt afterward. What? That's it? Can it be? Really? All the old habits return, trying to reclaim their ancient jurisdiction. The voice of Mara is ancient and universal, yet it need not be an obstacle. It's only a test. Another Dharma gate we must then pass, personally vow, that is, to wake to. I know someone, a senior Zen teacher, who long ago, after having passed on their initial, been passed on their initial koan, put themselves back on move for another three years before finally accepting what they already had. In fact, many excellent Zen teachers, when first sanctioned to teach, may go through several early years of feeling like frauds, even while they're teaching and guiding others quite well. We are all in the same boat, all members of the same one knows to I hold human society. The Buddha was no different. Even he, in the last moments before his full and complete perfect realization of the endless way, Anyuttara, Samyak, Sambodhi, perfect, complete enlightenment, faced yet one more time our most ancient and persistent limitation, self-doubt. This is a very realistic and generous teaching, legendary as it may be, it rings absolutely true. There's a lovely touch of myth, too, when Kalanagaraja, the Naga king, raises his ancient head and linear time falls away. For an instant, we are in the inconceivability of timelessness. That bowl forging upstream against the current reminds us, too, that we must go against the endless flow of thoughts, concepts, ideas that form a veil between us and this breathe, this breeze, rather, this breath, if we would wake. The little clink of bowl against bowl also tells its own profound story, dramatizing the proof, the truth that many have gone down this ancient road before. The story of the Buddha's enlightenment is part of the classical canon and is at the same time a demonstration of the heart of our own practice now. Buddhist tradition says that we all have the nature of Buddha, have exactly the same vast, empty nature of endless and creative potential as Shakyamuni and all previous Buddhas. From the first, we are each fully and equally endowed with limitless wisdom and compassion. And because it is already who we are, if we practice, if we make the effort, then we too can, to one degree or another, realize that is awake to our original mind. Enlightenment is not a thing we can get. If anything, it comes from losing, not gaining, losing what we cling to, losing all that ancient, interior, self-centered stuff that cuts us off from wind, rain, sun, moon, stars, trees, animal, people. With that great and wonderful failure, that liberating loss, we find true intimacy, which is what we've been missing and seeking for who knows how long. Enlightenment is a name, just a name given to our being able to attest to original intimacy with all things, sun, moon, stars, wind, rain, snow, clouds, trash, bugs, cats, rivers, mountains, trees. We do not gain it because it has never been lost like the ground that has always been here. We just didn't have the steadiness to notice. And with that inability to recognize what is always truly so comes a host of both greater and lesser problems, ranging from simple dissatisfaction to real anguish, as well as full-blown blown greed, hatred, and selfishness. Zen's approach to this is honest, direct, and clear. Zen says, okay, if we already are this enlightened nature, then simply belief in it, while it's a good start, won't ultimately do. In the same way, theorizing about it won't do. Only personally resolving the questions, where is it 
And why don't I know it? Can truly satisfy our longing for reality. Ehei Dogen in 13th century Japan agonized over this until through ongoing zazen he had it resolved. We too bore into such questions like a thirsty person drilling for water, which means not blindly, the sonar survey, the life of the Buddha, the Jatakas, and Zen teaching show us that the water is there. We have a map, not in blind belief. All the water we will ever need is already beneath our feet. With this in mind, we keep at it. We sit and sit. We go to Doksan, hear Taisho. We examine precepts in our daily lives, experience the breath, count the breath, just sit or endlessly return to koan point after koan point again and again. The Buddha, the ex-prince, came to his final touching the earth moment after lifetimes of practice, as the Jataka show. For many people, it may not be for years into their practice, after initial milestones and glimpses, that the gate opens wide and they settle down and really know it for sure. The Buddha's enlightenment, though, tradition says, was unique. For it was complete, every level of character and mind fully realized, and it was so because of all the countless lifetimes of work that preceded it. In substance, every Kensho, the small kind we're likely to realize, and the Buddha's great enlightenment are the same, but in actual content they are vastly different. Buddhist mythos says that in this world age, no one experienced more deeply than Shakyamuni, because no one had worked so hard to prepare the ground. He touched not only the ground, but the bottomless bottom and the soaring heights. Comparing our practice realization to his would be like comparing the finger painting of a kindergartner to a work by Rembrandt or Picasso. The substance is the same, both are paintings, but the degree of conscious realization is vastly different. Yet we must all begin somewhere. And for the kindergartner, that finger painting can be just as meaningful as Rembrandt's work. Just to him. The Buddha's story is home-leaving and forest path exertions, his abandonment by his ascetic disciples, his solitary face-off with Mara, the primordial force of his and our innate ignorance, completes his long Jataka path. Touching the earth, he gets up and walks on, transcending the final temptation to sit forever at ease in his long-sought, hard-won pavilion of complete enjoyment, freedom, wisdom, and peace. Instead, he devotes the next 50 years of his life to walking the dusty roads, teaching those who, while in reality as complete and whole as he, just don't know it. He goes back into the seeming chaos of the 10,000 things, at peace with it all, a half-smile on his lips. How could this be? Case 37, Shoyoroku, a book of serenity, goes like this, Yang Shan's Karmic Consciousness. Yangshan asks Kweishan, suppose a man asks you, how about one who says all sentient beings are in a disorderly karmic consciousness and have no base to rely upon? How would you treat him? Kweishan said, if a man appears, I call to him. When he turns his head instantly, I say, what is that? I wait while he hesitates, and then I say to him, there is not only disorderly karmic consciousness, but there is no base to rely upon. Yangshan said, oh, good. To return to the Buddha beneath the tree, why did he get up and how did he know truth? How did he realize it? Just prior to the moment of enlightenment after the, the Buddha to be six years of exhaustive effort and countless kalpas of Jataka practice exertions going the limit, trying and trying with all he had, drawing on the power of his countless previous efforts, his failures and triumphs, Mara, the Buddha's tempter or distractor, the inner voice of ego, takes off his masks and appears nakedly. Mara is worried. He or she or it's begun to see that Siddhartha may escape. They find a way through the subtlest nets of self-centeredness and awake to innate Buddhahood. Desperate, Mara makes a last-ditch effort to turn the once sheltered but now deeply determined ex-prince from the goal by pulling out his ace in the hole, self the doubt we all, to one extent or another, share. What? I have this true nature? It is me? I can realize it? Really? This doubt convinces us to cling to belief in the solidity of a forever separate winning-losing 
interior self. It is a root belief gluing us to what is only provisionally real. So Mara confronts the Buddha to be an ass. How could you, a sheltered ex-prince, be worthy of the supreme goal of complete and perfect enlightenment? Get real. Better men and women than you have aimed for this and failed. You're still young and a beginner to boot. Give yourself more time to work at it. Eventually, you might have a chance. You've got the basic ability, but now, no way. Back off. Take it slow. It's a reasonable request and reasonable advice. Reasonable is all get out. Devilishly reasonable. Take it easy. Be careful. Go slow and steady. Prepare. Reduce ego concerns. Don't be hasty. At this crucial juncture, with worlds hanging in the balance, Siddhartha doesn't waste breath arguing with the habit voice of his own separateness, his own predilection towards self-centeredness or egotism. He doesn't even try to put together a reasonable counter-argument. To enter the fray is to have already lost. Ready? Not ready? The self that gains, the self that loses, the self that has it, the self that doesn't have it. He doesn't get sucked into Mara's metaphor at all. Instead, seeing the joke, he probably smiled. Maybe he allowed himself the luxury of shaking his head in pity for poor old Mara. Then he reached down and touched the earth and let the earth witness for him. And the earth witness to all the countless jatakas, all those past life's sincere efforts toward realization, replied with thousands of interwoven voices speaking as one. Interbeing, to use uh, Thich Nhat Hanh's lovely term, speaks up. And Mara is overwhelmed and thoroughly defeated. His last effort to tempt the Buddha to be to falter and cling to a limited view of me and here and everything and everyone else out there is crushed. This is the Zen moment in the story, a moment of direct pointing, not clinging to a particular sutra, statement, vision, path, or text, not clinging to words at all. The humble, right here, right now, ever-present ground speaks, confirming worth beyond measure. Our own worth. The Buddha's worth. A bug's worth. Beyond measure. Ripeness is all. Progressive one step after another practice, one step after another, one step after another practice, bows before right now, right here, mind. Wu Men's final verse for the gateless barrier goes like this. That is the Wu Men Kong or Mu Man Kong. Before you take a step, you are already there. Before your tongue has moved, your Taisho is finished. Though your every step is ahead of the last, you must remember the vast, all-encompassing crater, vast emptiness. Touching the earth is touching the ground, the clay, the foundation of who and what we are, of dust we are made. Adam, first man, gets his name from Adama. That's Hebrew for earth. Human is from the Latin, humanus, means groundling. Touching the ground is touching the ground of being, of being us. Sheshin means to touch the mind, the ground of being. We sit for days in Sheshin and get grounded. We touch ordinary nature, ordinary mind, acknowledging and accepting ourselves, including past errors and efforts. We let our own jataka past, our own births and lives, including those that occur in this lifetime, confirm us. All have been our route to this present moment, this present person. Jataka tales are the record of the Buddha's own practice history. It is a long history, said to go back eons, world ages, big bangs. We too, according to Buddhist tradition, have our own progressive history. We easily accept those that arise out of childhood. Things happened that made us who we are. We stumbled, scratched our knees, got up, let the wound scab over, tried again. Sometimes we met with joy, sometimes with sorrow. Perhaps we can also accept that as with the Buddha, 
our history might extend through ages. Where does the path of causation that unfolds as each plant, bug, animal, bird, us, begin? Where does it begin? This need not be upheld as some grand idea, our interest in music or literature, in cooking or Zen. Does it come from genes, the ancestral experience woven into our DNA, or our own past lives? Which could mean past lives in this life, things that happened. The things that made us who we are. Each moment has a lineage of effects and causes. Bodhidharma's one mind precept states self-nature is inconceivably wondrous. Our nature, the nature that right now hears sounds, feels sensations, thinks thoughts, the nature that gets hungry and eats, tired and sleeps, is wondrous. A cut bleeds and then it heals. A veggie burger becomes a thought, an idea, a symphony, a heartbeat, a muscle, how can we explain such daily miracles? As inconceivably wondrous as our nature is, it's not an ideal we might one day attain. True nature is who we are. Like the ground beneath us, it has always been here. Why else was the sky so blue when we were children? Why the grass so green? The mysterious empty ground of being has been our support through the endless past right up to this moment now. The ground we walk on is full of microbes, germs, worms, and bugs. Mind ground is full of doubts, fears, pride, worries, regrets. Neither the ground beneath us nor mind itself are sanitized. Yet when we were children, we could stretch out fearlessly on the ground. We could roll on it, lie on it, gaze up at clouds, sky, and birds. We could pick up dirt, rub it into our jeans and hands and hair, and come home shining. When did we become afraid to touch the earth? When did we start to think we were too good for it, that it was not just support, but beneath us? When we were young, we explored our minds effortlessly fearlessly experimenting with sounds, shapes, colors, movements, emotions, health, sickness, ideas, as well as internal narratives and voices. When did we learn to fear our own nature? At his moment of final challenge, the Buddha touched the earth. He didn't reach for the sky and beg for help from something or someone above. He didn't fall for Mara's metaphor and try to win the debate and out-argue the distractor. We simply touch the always present, selfless ground and ask the earth, the earth to witness. Asking the earth to witness is asking the earth to testify to what she'd seen in those past Jataka lives. Her response confirms him and overwhelms doubt. What builds solid ground beneath us is the work we each do right now. Roshi Kaplow used to say, if you don't let the Dharma down, the Dharma will never let you down. No effort is wasted. Like drops of water filling a pail, it all adds up. Drop by drop. And the earth itself, the foundation of and for all, answered the Buddha to be saying, it's not the first time. He's earned great worth by his own past efforts. It is the right time. This moment is the culmination. Countless selfless efforts have come before. I am the witness. The time is now. What makes it such a lovely story is that it's not simply ancient history. It's our story, too. This moment is part of the ongoing Jataka series of the unfully realized Buddhas we each are. The central nature, mind itself, the ground beneath us is always here, life after life, moment after moment, breath after breath, thought after thought koan after koan. Past lives, past thoughts, decisions, and events lead to this present one in which we sit, walk, stand, eat, work, worry, create, pick our noses. Come day's end, we say goodnight and lie down on the ground of our nature, the ground we practice from, have always been standing on, 
whether we know it or not. And it, too, is always ready to testify for us. Our most fundamental vow as human beings is to know ourselves. This is why we practice. Zen Master Dogen famously wrote out the central realization of our practice in a few well-chosen words. When the self advances, that is the thing we call me, advances to become one with the 10,000 things, it's called delusion. When the 10,000 things advance and confirm the self, when the world steps in and wipes us away, Gone, gone, entirely gone, says the Prajna Paramita. This is called enlightenment. The 10,000 things are birds, bugs, clouds, mountains, rivers, people, animals, traffic sounds, cell phones, raindrops, pebbles, clumps of earth, bright morning stars. Ordinary things confirm us, tell us, indeed make us who we are every day. In reality, there is no barrier between us and a single thing, not even as much as a single hair or speck of dust. That enlightenment is intimacy, is not cleverness or serendipity. It is simply the way of things. Touching the earth is always possible. Wonderful intimacy is always possible is the ground. Mind is never far away. Dogen says in the Shobogenzo chapter titled, Mind Itself is Buddha, that even one instant is, Mind Itself is Buddha. Shakyamuni Buddha himself, says Dogen, is, Mind Itself is Buddha. He says too that if you realize this, Mind itself. There is not an inch of ground left on earth. No ground beneath us. No sky above. Everything, all concepts of this or that are totally gone. It is that intimate. What is that like? Let's turn to our good friend of the West, William Blake, for closing words. He says it's simply to see a world in a grain of sand, a heaven in a wildflower. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand, eternity in an hour. It's auguries of innocence. Whenever and wherever, it doesn't have to be in a zendo by any means. It's got nothing to do with sitting quietly in one place. Well, that's how it happened for the Buddha. Whenever and wherever we touch such ground, east or west, we are home. But to really get it, we must still risk everything we've gained. Glance up and really see the morning star. We'll stop there. <clears throat>